Thank you very much. So I want to thank the organizers for the, this very nice uh, um, symposium. Um, before to start, I want to say that I don't know uh, if Syndrome E exists, and I think that's part of the discussion of, of today and, and tomorrow. But what I know is that Syndrome de l'imposteur exists, and that's exactly what I'm experiencing right now, because when, uh, <laughs> when it was asking to me to contribute to this, I was, you know, I'm a good inner joiner, so I said, yes, that's great, that's very interesting. And then I start to think, and I, the more I think about, the less I, I was feeling that I have something interesting to say about it. So what, what I will say today, it's what um, I think, about, what uh, emerged of this, uh, of this uh, reflection about the subject. And in fact, I just started two, uh, two months ago or something like that, and didn't think about it all the time. Uh, I try to inject part of my work in it, but it's, I think it's my first lecture where uh, what I, I'm really doing will be in one slide over all the other slides. Okay, this given, and before to start, really, the talk, I want to ask everybody here a question. How many among us actually pull a trigger? Okay, so there is actually, but I mean pull a trigger to kill. Okay, that's the point. <laughs> the, hmm? A mass murderer will tell me, actually. But if, no, uh, what, what my point is, if I ask this very same question 70 years ago, or 80 years ago, or maybe even 60 years ago, the answer will be different, because some people will have done it in a war, uh, in a, in a war, um, uh, in a war zone, which is not the case anymore. And what I'm trying to say now as a kind of introduction, we as a society, we are not accustomed to war, at least the Western society, as we used to be. And I think our relationship with mass, mass murder is directly um, uh, tainted by this fact. We are not used to it anymore. Hmm? For the time being, that's a very important point that people who argue against Europe, I think, don't think about it too much. Anyway. I think it's better to argue about, about, about uh, central governments than to fight with our neighbors, as uh, we did for a long time. Yes, but that's something new. But maybe that's we, we can discuss after. Okay, so now I'm not completely finished with my introduction because now I want to show you two series of slides. So it will be pornography again. I think we had enough of pornography today, but uh, I will continue a little more. Actually, with what, all, what you have seen before, maybe that will not have the effect I expected right now. That's the first series. Ah, see, I've heard some uh, words. So the first one is from the Armenian genocide. Uh, the second one is uh, War in the Reef. It, it was a Spanish war in, in, in Morocco. And the third one, actually, you must know it, it's from uh, Vietnam War. And this picture, when I was a kid, um, haunted me for a long time. That's, I think it was uh, the first time I realized what is really war on, the, on TV. And actually, it's not a picture, it's a film. So now, look at this. You don't have at all the same feeling. But the scene represented exactly the same. You have one crucifixion, you have one bearded man, it's uh, Judith Holofern, a very uh, common term, uh, term in, in art. And the third one, actually, is uh, probably one of the earliest uh, display of killing. It's come from a Mycenaean, Mycenaean um, uh, seal, so something like uh, 16th century before Christus. And it just shows a man killing another one. So it's exactly the same three pictures, but we don't feel at all the same. And the reason why we don't feel at all the same is because this is painting or engraving, and this is actual picture, real photos. And I think also, I will come back to this later, but I think also that this has something to do with the way we uh, feel we, about mass murder. And maybe that give, can give us some cue about. So the original hypothesis of, of the day is that syndrome E is a particular case of defect of moral judgment. I think we agree on this. That is a statement uh, that uh, um, uh, make us have this meeting. And because neural judgment is a high brain function, can we detect in the brain the origin of syndrome E? And, and Jean gave us some, uh, some uh, aspects this morning. There is other work showing this, that you can uh, find um, some neural correlate of neural judgment in the cortical area. So 
we all agree with that, and the question is how, how it really works. Because it's nice to show a picture, but that don't tell us exactly uh, what, uh, what is behind. Probably uh, Matthias will talk about it tomorrow, and Etienne Coquelin, I see, we have some hypotheses. I'm going from the basal ganglia field, so for those who are not familiar with uh, neuro, um, neuroscience, basal ganglia is a network of, maybe I can show you this picture, it's a network of nuclei which are below the cortex, and actually that's a much older structure than the cortex. All the vertebrates have basal ganglia, while you really talk about cortex in the mammals. But they are deeply involved in decision making and learning, and with the evolution of cortex, cortex came into the game and interact with the basal ganglia for uh, learning and decision making in general. So to make a brief, uh, um, long story short, my, my work, what my work is about, is that you have this basic network constituted of cortex, basal ganglia, and thalamus, which are involved in some um, uh, functional loop, so there is no one structure would take a role, the whole structure is playing a role, and if we want to make it short, cortex will put out output, and that can be automatized at some point, while the basal ganglia will teach them and, and play and uh, will uh, interact with them mainly for reinforcement learning or for reassessing if there is need for reassessment. So you need the whole system in order to be able to decide, but once you have learned something uh, and it's, it's already uh, deep in your mind, basically you can remove basal ganglia, so this could explain why in some disease like uh, Parkinson's disease, where basal ganglia is not working anymore, people are still able to decide, they, are, they have some problem for moving and so on, but they can still able to, uh, they can make decisions, but to learn new things it's much more difficult for them. And they also have some cognitive impairment, but I don't, don't want to go into detail. And what I say also is that um, you know that cortex is huge and is divided in different um, functional area, and you have this kind of uh, uh, continuum of cortical area interacting with subcortical area, which play a role in decision making. You will need uh, the singular network and the hippocampus to build up mental representation. Then it will move to the orbitofrontal network in order to project the subject into this representation and value, give value to different options they can take. And then the prefrontal network will choose once all this process is performed. So I'll summarize in one uh, slide uh, what I'm doing as a neurophysiologist. So I think what is interesting in the, theor the theory of, uh, uh, you call it cortical fra uh, mental fracture? What is the, the cognitive. Cogni cognitive fracture? I think there is something right in it because uh, if something happens, in syndrome E because it's something which is related to automatic features and is a desensitive from some kind of learning and especially the learning you can get from your gut feeling that what you are doing is wrong, it's something which is located at the cortical level. This given, let's go now to uh, evolution. So as I told you, in all vertebrates you have this, this, uh, this loop but in uh, lower vertebrate and in birds, they not really have cort um, cortex. Cortex appear with mammals and re really develop, developed sorry, in the primates. And the main primates are, you know, there is two family of primates, the, um, the monkeys and the apes, and we are apes. So the other apes are gorilla, um, chimpanzees, uh, bonobo, and so on and so on, and belong to the same family as us. And the question we can ask is, can we have some kind of syndrome E in, uh, in other species? Can we find some cue that th this uh, syndrome exists in other species? The answer is bar barely not, actually. There is maybe one example, I found this, and it's, it's a paper from 2006, and I never found any other paper about the subject in chimpanzees since, but in this case it was interesting, there was a lethal intergroup aggression by chimpanzees, and he went up to the elimination of all the male of the other group. So it was like a kind of genocide, but there is one case in chimpanzees that have been observed, 2006, no more cases since. So it looks like uh, we don't share this feature with the rest of um, the animals. We, so it's, it looks like if syndrome E exists, is specific to human nature. So 
what, what are now the historical, or let's say the archaeological evidence of syndrome E? It's hard to say that you have mass murder uh, per se uh, before we have uh, written evidence, but at least we can say that warfare, uh, which is some kind of necessity for uh, uh, mass murdering, uh, um, emerge something like, so it's, it's a broad, um, it's a broad time scale between uh, 40,000 and 6,000 before Christus. And in, so it's in, uh, we are in the Neolithic now, in the uh, in Neolithic period. And it seems to evolve that the main theory, there is no consensus on it, but that's the main theory, from border on butch to territory controls. So warfare emerged for terico territory controls, and of course, terito terico terico territory controls, sorry, is a control of resource in order that the herd can, or the or the tribe, we don't really know what, we, what it was at this time, but can have enough resources in order to, uh, to continue to prosper. But then, we have more, uh, much more uh, histor uh, historical evidence, and all the examples which have been given today uh, are from the 20th century, but in fact, mass murder exists much before. And so, of course, I give uh, uh, here mainly examples from the 20th century. Uh, so uh, there is um, Armenian, Genocide here. Um, this is a Spanish civil war, which have been forgot, forgotten, but it's one of the big providers of mass murder on both sides. And of course, it, it lasts longer for the second side because of the dictatorship of Franco uh, that, um, that uh, happened after. But at the end of the war, it was barely even, the, 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 mass, ma the mass murder on both sides. Uh, this, you know, this is the, the, the famous picture of Shoah. Um, this is the massacre of Nankin, actually uh, Nankin. This was the second uh, case of um, uh, war crimes which have been judged during the Second war, uh, World War. So it was um, made by Japanese Imperial Army in, uh, in China. Okay, we already talked about uh, Vietnam War. But these two, for example, and it's ju just two examples I, I wanted to show with pictures, because I have pictures of it. Uh, this one is completely forgotten. It's called the ma ma Massacre of Kampor. It's a case of uh, hundreds of uh, women and children who have been killed during the Indian mutiny. So they were slaughtered in a house, and uh, half dead, they were thrown in, uh, in, a, in a well and left for dead uh, inside the well. So that was a big thing at, the, at this time, but uh, of course, uh, like uh, most of things in history, they uh, end up forgotten. This one is, was also very famous, is the uh, Wunandi massacre. Uh, it was in uh, 1818. In, uh, in USA, it was one of the last big uh, uh, massacre of uh, Indian people, I mean, uh, American Indian people. And something I, I like to show, um, uh, maybe you can discuss a little bit also, uh, this representation of a pharaoh, which is very, so this one is Tuzmozi the third, and this kind of representation are very often present in, in, uh, in Egyptian temples. They show them, so here maybe you don't see very well, but you have the pharaoh here. Here in his hand you have the, um, the, the hairs of several prisoners. And in his hand you have a big, um, big stick and he's, he's in position of just beating them to death. So that's a kind of representation of mass murder by one guy at this time and it, it's displayed on the temple. So at this time you can see that mass murder was not something which was considered as a crime. It was even praised. Maybe it's something related to uh, uh, the um, uh, scapegoat uh, you mentioned earlier. So, okay, war is not syndrome E, but syndrome E is defined as a mismatch between a killing behavior and a gentle behavior. But even so, we have a lot of examples uh, in mythology, literature, or history. And a lot of characters were praised as models. So again, I give you some examples here. Maybe the more significant one, Hector, Hector in the Iliad. He was um, on one, I don't know all of uh, who in this room or, uh, did you read uh, completely the Iliad, but more than half of the Iliad is a massacre, the description of people killing other people. And Hector is one of them. And then after, we have this scene where he's playing with his child and uh, he's, uh, he's amused by how the child reacts to, uh, to his helmet. Uh, this is less famous, uh, but is very prominent in, uh, in uh, Roman mythology. It's Coriolan, who is supposed to have massacred a full city, and then after coming back to Rome, he refused to take the leadership of the city and went back to his field and to, uh, to live the life of a farmer. Uh, I will go quickly, but this one is Simon de Montfort, a very famous French character, 
who uh, is most famous sentence for kill them all, God will recognize his own. Uh, these two characters, I, uh, I like them. Um, Kukulain, I think it's Kukulain, something like that, is a character of um, Irish mythology. And here you have the Berserker, which are characters of the, of the um, uh, North mythology. And both share the same characteristic, which is they became mad at war and just killing friends and foe equally. And then after, they live a norm normal life. And they are praised, they are considered as heroes, not as a mass murderer. This one, I don't know if you recognize him, but he's, uh, he's a guy called Custer. So he's very famous in the American mythology for having died at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But what everybody forgets, that eight years before Little Bighorn, he was a guy who killed hundreds of women and, and children in the so-called Battle of Washita River. It was not a battle, they just uh, a troop of cavalry uh, come to an Indian village and burn, kill, and rape everybody. And I like this like example because I think that that's the hinge. It's um, originally it's um, a novel about the First World War, and it's about a character who was the, the example of the warrior. It was uh, if you listen, and, and there was a very nice movie made by uh, by Bertrand Tavernier on it. That the kind of character who wins the war, who was do, doing the job, uh, killing people with uh, uh, with a knife and bayonet and grenades. Uh, while, while the other were just pretending doing this. And then you have some difficulties to readapt to the real life. And I think that is where the hinge is. And if we go now uh, to the second part, we'll see that the model of, of this model of character became an anti-model at the hinge between the 19th century and the 20th century. And one of my hypotheses, and it's a pure speculation, something we can discuss, is that photography play a role. And this is why I show you this picture at, at the beginning of the talk. You don't react the same at photography of massacres and as pictures showing massacres. And I think it has something to do with the way our brain are processing this image. And maybe it's, it's a cue that we can uh, look out when we try to define why some people are doing this and why some people are not doing this. So, massacres is a common feature of history, actually. And we can uh, make summary in three phases. We have the, from Neolithic to uh, the 17th century, where violence to civilians is perfectly accepted as a consequence of fortune of war. So you have all these examples. Kill them all, God's recognize his own. Uh, Vae Victis, which is famous in, in, uh, in the Roman mythology, what's one of the um, Gallic um, uh, king who took Rome, uh, says about uh, what's uh, uh, Roman, um, uh, what will be the, the future of the Roman which have been taken? The Victis mean uh, in English, uh, Malheureux vaincu. I don't know what you translate in English. The Victis, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or there when Massacre can even be praised as a symbol of mightiness. I show you this example of Egyptian propaganda. If you go back to Genesis also, uh, there is a lot of cases where uh, the God of Israel is a God of massacre. Then, uh, with, under the influence of enlightenment, at the 18th century, violence to civilians, at least between civilized people, is gradually considered as amoral. But toward other cultures, within them, it's, it's still so. You can continue to massacre Indian, and it's not or, uh, or African people. It is, it's morally accepted, or even encouraged. And at the 20th century, so after the industrial era, violence to civilians became generally considered as mor morally intolerable. Or there is some people who claim that it's not a question of morale, but it's, it's a question of economy, because you disrupt the economic, uh, um, the economic roots. And I think also it's related, my, my own hypothesis is also related to, to photography. Uh, and we, at the end of the World War II, the notion of crime of war was invented, uh, and crime, crime against humanity is invented, invented, sorry. But which is not completely clear, it's, in the meantime, the notion of total war is justified, and, and um, you can address civilian targets with carpet bombing without being uh, considered as a war criminal. None of the uh, people in the bomber command, the English uh, high, um, high command of the, who uh, completely wipe out most of the main German city have been a judge for uh, mass murder. So, what history teaches us is that moral judgment toward mass murder evolved in human societies since the Neolithic. 
So I will say that syndrome E is not a by um, is a byproduct, sorry, of the evolution of moral judgment and not a pathology per se. The question is how sensitive that, come back to the talk we have earlier, we are to uh, syndrome E. Oh yes, this is just to, to, to play with Dresd and if Dresd was uh, uh, right or, or wrong. So, Milgram experiment, and you have uh, other, uh, other demonstration uh, earlier, told us that um, almost everybody can do this. It's, so it's, it's uh, the sensitivity, you said, is 80% of the population, and you have a lot of replication of Milgram experiments, they are all in a high uh, percentage. While when you talk about pathology, let's, say, let's talk about um, uh, you, you, I know you said that's not an argument, but for maybe what is the closest pathology you can find in psychiatry, which will be drug addiction, the highest percentage, enfin, the average percentage is 20%. There is a highest percentage for alcohol, for example, or for cigarettes, but average percentage is 20%. So you are in much lower, um, in much lower range. So I'm not sure it's something we can't, you, can't, you cannot treat sensitivity to addiction in the same way as you can treat sensitivity to uh, mass murdering because you are much more prone to do this. You are, um, your uh, uh, human nature is much more uh, inclined to go to this. There is also other experiments uh, like the Bobo doll which tell us that aggressiveness can easily, easily be triggered in children and I think uh, we have some very nice example with, uh, um, I always forget the name of the, uh, of the, this uh, murderer you talked about earlier but Anyway, so um, what we can tell of all of this is that intraspecies aggressiveness is a specific feature of human nature. So it's not a byproduct of, ev of evolution, but more of um, peri, uh, let's say, of cultural evolution, which is the main feature of human, uh, human nature. We found trust of it at least in the analytic. And um, it was praise for a long time, but evolution of the society, and maybe the development of photography, that is one of my hypotheses, make murderous tendencies not socially acceptable anymore, which I think is a good thing, and that's what is nice with a social evolution. We can achieve great feats with that. And the, because most of us are not exposed anymore to conditions where killing is legitimate, we consider it that pathologic, but experimental psychology tells us that we are probably much more prone to do it than to become addicted to drugs, for example. So the solution, and we have some uh, example earlier, must be educational and politic. And I want to show some perspective now, maybe to open the discussion. It's good that I have the last talk. I didn't was aware, of, I didn't realize it when uh, I saw the, the program. So um, what is the evolution thread that pulls the trigger? Uh, there is this book, I don't know if some of you read it, of David Reddish, The Mind Within the Brain, and he claimed that the cause is most powerful than the authority in Milgram experiment. What people are doing this, and I think it's a sense of the talk you gave uh, just before, um, people are not doing this because they are uh, under an authority, they're doing this because they believe in the cause. And in, there is in some relation of Milgram experiment. Uh, this is not in the data uh, in the paper, but in some uh, diaries. He said that when he says to people, he pledges them, says them, please, in the sake of science, uh, if you don't do this, I will not complete my experiment and the knowledge will not be achieved. The compliance was much more higher. So it's, it's, it's really not the authority in this case. And he didn't push because he wanted to push, uh, to push his story about authority. But in fact, it's more a question of cause. So I will postulate here to come back to my uh, introduction, that this notion of cause, it's an abstract, and this is completely speculative, and I will be happy to, to discuss it, it's an abstract extension of the concept of territories. We started war, human uh, nature, human people, human uh, colonies started war for territory control, and uh, were able to kill in order to control territories, to, to keep the control of territories. And now we extended this, this notion in an abstract way, so people who are not sharing the same abstract territories as you deserve to die because it's an aggression, a possible aggression toward your, um, your abstract territories. And this abstract territory can, can be anything, your culture, your race, if you believe in race, your religion, your soccer club, whatever you want. So 
uh, that will be almost the end of my talk, and I will let specialists in degradation politics make their own conclusion upon how to deal with these very roots of human nature. To go back to neuro neuroscience, because this is the reason why I was invited, I want to propose some, uh, some uh, leads of where it's happened in the brain, even if it's not a pathology that will not save us to try to look out where it's happened in the brain. And we, if we have, this, if we consider that is have something to do with the representation of cause as mental territories, it should be around here where we built up mental representation, so in the singular network and the hippocampus. If there is something to do also in the way we value moral according to or treatment of real pictures versus a real photography or real life picture versus um, versus painting or or, uh, or art, it's have something to do. It's I was pretty broad here of between the, build, the building of the mental representation and the projection of the subject into this uh, representation. And if it has something to do with the ability to choose between different options and to choose a bad one, uh, in this case, it will be in the prefrontal network. So that, I think that uh, basically it's all the brain. I'm sorry about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you have here at least different possible cues. Uh, location to uh, look out and maybe some uh, some thread for a further discussion. Thank you for your attention.